We lost the first few minutes of this recording, so please allow me to introduce our speaker now. Rebecca McGorry is a subject matter expert on the Russo-Ukrainian War and holds master's degrees in conflict analysis and resolution, Mediterranean security, and Russian and Eurasian studies. After living and working for many years in countries including Ukraine, Russia, and China, she currently works as a program officer at the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, where the population served include Ukrainians who fled the war in the last 18 months. In Ukraine, there are two dominant languages. In Ukraine, there are two dominant languages. There's Ukrainian and there's Russian. In Eastern Ukraine, many people speak only Russian, but across Ukraine as a whole, most people speak both. The Russian word for Kyiv written in English is K-I-E-V, and the Ukrainian word written in English is K-Y-I-V. So both of these are technically correct in their respective languages, but Kyiv is the Russian term for the city. Kyiv is the Ukrainian one, so I'm going to use the Ukrainian one. So going into the history, how are Russia and Ukraine related to each other? We have to start very, very early on, um, and I'll go through this as quickly as I can so that we can get to kind of the more modern stuff. At the core of the debate about which country is real or which one came first is what's called Kievan Rus. This was claimed by Ukraine, sorry, is claimed by Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia as the root of their current society and culture. For the first three years that it existed, the capital was Novgorod, which is now in Russia. After that, though, it was Kiev in what is now Ukraine for more than 350 years of its existence. Russian and Ukrainian languages both diverged after the fall of Kiev and Rus. So it's not like one of them came from the other one. They shared a root language that they both sprang from. In the 17th century, the Cossack Hetmanate rose. This was the equivalent of a Ukrainian nation state. We could say the first Ukrainian nation state. It was later taken and divided between Russia and Poland, and then later just by Russia alone. And that leads us up to the 1900s. And we have a, a few core events that happened in the 1900s that kind of set the stage. In 1917, inspired by the Russian Revolution, Central and Eastern Ukrainians broke away and formed what they called the Ukrainian People's Republic after centuries of Russian rule. So this was following the Cossack Hetmanate. In 1922, Ukrainian People's Republic was seized by the Russian army and annexed into the Soviet Union, where it was called the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. From 1932 to 1933, we have what's known as Holodomor. This is a Ukrainian famine that was caused by the Russian seizure of Ukrainian grain to feed Moscow and Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg. Approximately 7 million Ukrainians died in that famine. And this, I would say, more than just about anything else, is a, a real scar on Ukrainian history and a real um, major event when it comes to discussing or identifying the relationship between Russia and Ukraine because this was a very intentional choice on the part of the Soviet Union to take grain from a country that was quite able to feed itself and redirect it to what it considered its more major cities in Russia. And the results were pretty horrific, but it isn't really addressed in most modern day history. In 1939, Poland divided. Um, Poland was divided between Nazi Germany and the USSR. What's now Western Ukraine was also annexed into the USSR. In 1991, Ukraine declared independence during the fall of the Soviet Union, and in 1994, under the Budapest Memorandum, Ukraine agreed to give up all nuclear weaponry in exchange for a guarantee of protection from invasion. And that brings us to the events that have kind of directly led to where we are now. In 2004, there was what's called the Orange Revolution. In the Orange Revolution, it initially consisted of an election. Russian President Putin assigned his personal election, election campaign cabinet to Viktor Yanukovych. This was a pro-Russian candidate who was running for president of Ukraine at the time. His campaign was based on re-establishing relations with Russia, and his opponent, Viktor Yushchenko, was quite famously mysteriously poisoned. No one was ever truly able to identify how or why, but it's very strongly suspected that it was either Putin's campaign cabinet or it was Yanukovych himself that um, participated in the poisoning. Miraculously, however, he survived. 
Yanukovych won the election, but there was massive widespread fraud, fraud that was very easy to detect. It was similar in type and strategy to what we see in modern Russian presidential elections. And by that, what I mean is we would see numbers of ballots in a county that were actually higher than the number of people who lived in that county, for example. Or we would see um, statements and, and kind of political news coming from a certain region of Ukraine that very, very strongly indicated one direction. Um, and we would see election results that were like 99% voted for Yanukovych. So these were um, what we might say almost in intentional um, and very similar to Russian election results where even though Putin very often would win the election anyway, he still utilizes fraud to bolster his numbers. In response, a massive protest erupted in Ukraine that was known as the Orange Revolution. The result was that the election was held again under very close supervision by international authorities. This time, Viktor Yushchenko won by a significant margin. From 2013 to 2014, we have Euromaidan, also known as the Revolution of Dignity. So Yushchenko won, however, he actually received extremely poor ratings as president. And this time, Yanukovych was elected in earnest. He actually won the election without outside interference. However, at the last minute in the fall of 2013, Yanukovych backed out of an agreement with the European Union for Ukraine to ascend to the EU. Instead, he signed an economic agreement with Putin that would very, very closely really link and force reliance for the Ukrainian economy on the Russian economy. Protests once again erupt in Ukraine, and these continued on and off through February of 2014. A private police force called the Burkut violently suppressed them, especially in Kiev, with increasing severity. The Ukrainian protesters, however, succeeded. Yanukovych fled the country and went to Russia, where he was appointed mayor by Putin. From 2014 to 2021, we have the fallout and the war. Um, and this is probably where most people will remember starting to see headlines about the conflict. So Putin immediately moved on Crimea, sending Russian troops to cut it off from Ukraine and holding what was very likely to be a staged referendum. We say very likely to have been staged because those of us who weren't there, of course, we, we can't say for sure one way or the other. And there are two very extreme narratives. However, there is leaked footage of news anchors, for example, who were in voting booths that were completely empty for hours at a time. And um, although that's possible in any election, what's this? suspicious is that the official election results showed that more than 90% of Crimeans voted and 99% of those who voted voted in favor of the referendum. The new Ukrainian government outlawed Russian TV and radio and moved to eliminate Russian as a language on official documents in schools. Now, if you remember from a few minutes ago, the problem is that in eastern Ukraine, huge populations only speak Russian. So they created their own protests um, is, is a response to being denied access to the only language that they spoke. Russia seized the opportunity here, provided weapons, training, and in some cases, direct military support to separatist groups in Luhansk and Donetsk. This was the official beginning of the Russo-Ukrainian War. Um, so I, I want to make a, a quick note here that when people talk about the Russo-Ukrainian War over the last 18 months, everybody talks about it as if it began February 24th of 2022. However, the real start of the war was the seizure of Crimea in 2014. This effectively prevents Ukraine from ascending to the EU or NATO, the EU or NATO as engagement in ongoing active conflict disqualifies a country from being a candidate. And this is a really important piece that I think a lot of people miss um, when, when people are doing like political analyses. Russia's only motivation, at least in the very beginning, to keep Ukraine engaged in a war, even if they had no intention of winning it, was to prevent Ukraine from being able to join the EU or NATO, which was its original goal to begin with. The Minsk Protocol briefly coordinated a ceasefire, but it had collapsed by 2015. Minsk II was marginally more successful, and most of the fighting stopped, but Russian support continued. The conflict continued to have active status, and approximately 14,000 continued fighting and died in the war. Um, and this was the vast majority in 2015 and a little bit of 2016. Following that, the conflict itself became significantly less active, but still was going on. <laughs> 
I want to quickly define a term called a security dilemma. Some people may be familiar with it, but others may not be. This occurs when one country takes action to increase their security, and that makes another country feel insecure and do the same, leading to a back and forth and a formal escalation. So Ukraine was essentially utilized, to simplify matters, by NATO and the EU in the ongoing security dilemma with Russia, escalating relations over a period of years. So essentially, NATO and the EU would make the decision to host weapons in Ukraine near the Russian border. In response, Russia would move twice as many weapons down to that border. Ukraine would then um, move a number of soldiers along the border for um, what, what they would probably refer to as normal training. And British and Russia would do the same, but this time they would have four times as many soldiers. It would continue escalating, and that's the, the kind of core of a security dilemma to begin with. This kept the Russia invasion of Ukraine at bay. However, it heightened Eastern, Ukraine ten Eastern European tensions consistently all throughout this time. In 2020, President Trump made the decision to withhold arms from Ukraine unless Zelensky agreed to publicly investigate the Biden family. This plays a really, really integral role into the timing of this form, this, this phase of the war. Zelensky refused involvement, so Ukrainian aid was cut. During this time, Ukraine became very anxious, more and more anxious and more and more desperate to join, both to ensure protection from Russia and because the uh, cut aid from the United States was really, really difficult to replace. For, formally and publicly, the EU and NATO started to express that they were more amiable to the idea that even though Ukraine was still in active conflict with Russia, they were beginning to see a potential for Ukraine to join anyway. And that's what leads to 2022. And what I have here is a, a series of headline summaries um, that I hope will kind of explain what people were seeing really early in 2022, if you remember when the news started coming out even before the invasion took place. So first, afraid that Ukraine's ascension to the NATO and EU was imminent, Putin made plans to frame Ukraine for brutality to justify the invasion. U.S. intelligence publicly outed Russia's plans delaying the invasion. And this was, I think, the, the first inkling that U.S. news got that something was about to happen. On February 24th, Putin lost patience. He abandoned the original plan to provide justification and invaded Ukraine with a plan to have seized Kiev, assassinated Zelensky, and assumed control over the Ukrainian government by day two, which is incredibly ambitious and most of the world also seemed to think incredibly likely. On February 26th, uh, Ukraine was anticipating a massive assault on Kiev, which is also where the Ukrainian government is held. So Ukrainian President Zelensky informed his advisors that it was very likely to be the last day that they would see him alive. He didn't expect to live to the next morning. February 27th, Russia's planned overtake of Kiev failed due to a few a few different aspects. One of them was that the Ukrainian military defense set tactic and supply chain problems that they created for the Russian military created a lag, a really dramatic lag, and the Russian troops that were supposed to be there to be participating in the assault never arrived. As a response to that, Ukrainian morale soared and international aid began pouring in, and I'll get to that a little bit more later. On February 28th, the first round of negotiations between Russia and Ukraine occurred. On March 8th, the first and thus far only formal successful humanitarian corridor was established of this phase of the war, and 3,500 citizens were evacuated out of Sumy Oblast. Sumy is a city and uh, an oblast, like a, a state that borders Russia in kind of northeastern, northeastern central Ukraine. On March 18th, the number of refugees hit 3.3 million and the number of internally displaced hit 6.9 million. So within the first month, these were the, the top events, the top headlines that we were seeing. I want to go into what we actually know because there's a lot of speculation. And, and of course, in one hour, I don't think I can go into every single thing that we know about the war, but I'm hoping this will answer some of the questions that people have about what we have evidence for, what we have proof for, what's pure speculation. Again, the war didn't start in 2022. By most accounts, it started in 2014. 2022 was an escalation. And that's why I keep referring to it as this phase of the war. It's the same war. 
Number two, civilians and aid workers are being targeted and have been targeted since the start by Russian forces. Number three, Ukraine has seen thousands of civilian deaths. And again, we're going to get to those numbers here in a second. Number four, there have been more Russian soldier deaths than Ukrainian deaths, which I think a lot of people find surprising. However, despite the ongoing nature um, and despite what many people view as Russian superiority, the tactics that they're using result in really high numbers of soldier deaths. Number five, Russian soldiers are in some cases intentionally sabotaging their operations to avoid fighting. This has happened since the beginning, and it still appears to be ongoing, but in other cases, institutional incompetence is likely at fault. And an example that I want to give here is just in the last week, there have been headlines about Russia um, shooting down two of their own planes, for example. Those are probably not acts of intentional sabotage. The intentional sabotage tends to be from young ground troops that don't actually have a significant amount of power and whose responsibilities tend to be related to supply chains because there are significantly um, fewer um, consequences for them. It's much easier to defend it as, oh, we, we got a flat tire. So most likely this was a case of institutional incompetence. It was failure to, to recognize their, their own planes. Inside of Russia, reference to the war is as aggression against Ukraine, so referring to it as anything other than a, a very heroic mission by Russia is punishable by prison time. So let's take a closer look at some numbers. 28 million individuals have fled Ukraine since February 24th of 2022. These are mostly women and children because martial law prevents Ukrainian men between the ages of 16 and 60 from leaving Ukraine and has been imposed until at least November 15th. Um, it's been extended a couple of times now. November 15th is when the most recent extension ends. It could be extended again or it could end. Um, I also want to clarify here that it's not like there are Ukrainian soldiers who are at the border, you know, preventing Ukrainian men from going through. Um, there, there are some stations, of course, where, you know, they're checking passports. And especially more recently, it's become a lot easier now that they have systems in place. But a lot of it is um, just kind of the honor system. So they're, they're not checking every single person who's on a train. The result is that there are many men who have been able to get out and who have chosen to do so. Um, and there's also been a really high mental health toll for those men. Many of them have returned. In fact, 18 million of the 28 million total have returned to Ukraine as of October 3rd of 2023. So within the last week, these numbers. The 10 million who have not returned amount to an approximately 23% net loss of the population. So they've lost a quarter of their population in the 10 million that have left. Right now, there are 9,600 confirmed civilian deaths. However, this doesn't take into account many of the massacres that we know about but are unable to access. For example, Mariupol. Therefore, this number is likely tens of thousands of, num of numbers higher. So um, at the end of last year, for example, there were estimates going around that it had already reached 40 or 50,000. We're now coming up on almost a year later and many of these massacres are ongoing. Why and how did Ukraine survive? I think one of the questions people have is with this perceived superiority of the Russian military and with the lack of aid in the very beginning, how did Ukraine manage to withstand even just those first few days? And especially when their own president was so convinced that they wouldn't. And there's a bunch of reasons for that that I think are kind of important to go into. One of them is that the Russian soldiers weren't told initially that they were invading until just before the invasion began. They were ill-prepared, they were frightened, and they were also just kind of thrown at Ukraine as numbers, not really as elite soldiers. These were young soldiers that were often between ages 18 and 22, so they were barely trained. The Ukrainian government had time to prepare for this, and this is where the timing really comes in. Because this war has been going on since 2014, this was not a surprise to the Ukrainian government. The timing may have been a little bit of a surprise. However, they've been preparing for this since the original seizure of Crimea. Ukrainian morale was very, very high and continues to be very high. In addition, Ukraine offered food and housing to Russians who chose to defect, and the Ukrainian hotline for Russian soldiers to call and surrender had more than one million calls to it within its first year. <laughs> 
Ukrainians utilized effective guerrilla tactics like destroying road signs and switching off GPS signals, leaving Russians unable to navigate to their destinations. And again, these aren't trained soldiers. So they were essentially just lost on random roads in the middle of Ukraine. There were massive issues with Russian supply chains, fuel refills got lost or never arrived, and as I mentioned earlier, some Russian soldiers sabotaged their own forces, and this included um, disabling tanks and getting rid of entire like cast, sorry, cast iron fuel um, canisters. The world didn't expect Ukraine to last beyond the first couple of days, but once those days passed, the world began pouring aid into Ukraine, which is sustaining the military. Ukraine has an extremely large and very involved international diaspora that has also poured consistent funding, medical support, and military support into Ukraine. And that is also something that continues on today. So I want to take a look here at Inside Lviv. Um, this is actually a video that I took. I was in Ukraine earlier this year in April, and I actually haven't shown these pictures or these videos to anyone, but this felt like a good opportunity to do so. Um, because I want all of you to see what I saw when I arrived in Lviv. So, um, I feel like that's probably pretty surprising for a lot of people. Uh, I do want to give the disclaimer that Lviv, the city that I filmed this in, is very close to the Polish border. So it's in the far east and it hasn't seen a whole lot of fighting. But I, I think it's an incredible testament to the resilience of Ukrainians and also an inside look at how even during wars that have escalated to the degree that this one has escalated to, people in just about any part of the world will continue living the best way that they know how. And so what you're seeing in this video is soldiers in the middle of a town square while there's also a fair going on, not, not even a, a formal fair. These are just normal evening festivities, balloons being sold, people dancing, couples that are on scooters. This is what day-to-day -day life looks like in areas that aren't seeing constant active fighting. Oops. And then I also want to look at what the other side looks like inside of Ukraine. Um, I don't have, and I'm not going to provide any photos of that. I feel like if, if anybody wants to see them, you can probably find them online, but um, they can be quite disturbing. Fighting remains active amid several contested zones in Ukraine, largely in the east and southeastern borders. The fighting trajectory appears to be following the same path that it did in 2015 to 2016, where the fighting kind of regressed to the east and tapered off, but it remained perpetually active. The difference this time is in size and scope. I don't think we can reasonably expect that it is going to retreat to hundreds of deaths per year the same way that it did from 2015 to 2016 and since then. There is significant evidence with documents identified as recently as August of 2023, so just a couple of months ago, that Russia is engaging in a calculated and intentional ethnic cleansing campaign. Ukrainian civilians are being killed, kidnapped, re-educated, transported to Russia, or any mixture of the above. Mariupol, um, in particular, appears to be a planned 10-year campaign. That was what those, those documents allegedly uh, revealed was that they have a genocidal plan for 10 years to essentially get rid of what they view as the Ukrainian ethnicity, starting with Mariupol. And now inside of Russia, um, although Russia's election systems are famous for their fraud, as I mentioned earlier, even without fraud, Putin has never lost an election. So even when we account for it and we apply the curve and, and we figure out approximately how much fraud there was, he always won anyway. His popularity has decreased among those who have access to information from outside of Russia about Ukraine, but it has increased among those who are only accessing Russian controlled state media. 
Russia media, to be specific, is state controlled. So essentially, the Russian government has control over all media sources. And the central narrative right now is that the Nazis have returned. This time, they've returned to Ukraine instead of Germany, and Russia is fighting to defeat them. So this is provoking an extremely emotional and, and very patriotic sense from within Russia for, for all of the Russians that essentially buy into that narrative, which is the vast majority of them. This relaying of events focuses on a volunteer battalion inside of Ukraine that is very closely and openly associated with neo-Nazism. So what I want to make clear here is that, yes, what I'm saying is that there are Nazis in Ukraine. However, there are Nazis in Ukraine the same way that there are Nazis in the United States, the same way that there are Nazis in Germany, that there are Nazis in, in any country, because unfortunately, this is a very widespread ideology. The, the Ukrainian government itself is not associated with Nazism. However, the images that they've been using of this battalion are essentially what decorate all of Russian news. They use Nazi symbols, for example, and because they're fighting against the Russians, this is a very convincing narrative for those inside Russia, not to mention all of the fake images and videos that they're able to use. For example, deep fake videos of President Zelensky making what appear to be neo-Nazi speeches. Now, ironically, Russia also has openly neo-Nazi associated battalions that are fighting inside of Ukraine. Older and more conservative Russians believe this narrative completely, uh, for, for the most part, of course, and support the war in a very patriotic manner, similar to the American patriotism that erupted during World War II. Younger Russians, those with access to external media, and many students and professors do not believe it. But discussing it is a crime, and underground networks are very difficult to build in Russia, much more difficult than what we might view as an average country. And this has a lot to do with the fear tactics, the control tactics, and the kind of um, overwhelming sense at any moment that police officers on the streets in Russia are watching, and sometimes they are. Which brings me to the next question, is Russia a lost cause? Because the reality is that if you were to ask a Ukrainian, they would probably say yes. And that's why I wanna, I wanna start with this first column here. This is very important to me to note. There's a lot of Ukrainian anger and a lot of Ukrainian grief surrounding what they view as a country of evil citizens who have given up or given in to their dictator. And the reality within Russia is more complex, but Ukrainian emotions are very important um, when, when their lives are at stake and they're viewing things through the lens of people who are fighting for their lives and they think that they're seeing a country of citizens who are completely okay with their government massacring them. That does evoke a, a lot of feelings that I think we have to make sure we're respecting. In early 2022, so shortly after this, this phase of the war began, shortly after the invasion, there were significant protests and equally significant arrests inside Russia, so specifically people who were protesting the invasion. Students in particular were arrested in waves. Um, these protests were stomped out pretty universally, and Russia has a documented history of using military force against civilians in the name of peace. Russia's population controlling tactic is largely surprised and fear-based. What that means is that sometimes nothing happens at all. Sometimes there will be a protest and no one will say or do anything. It will just go on as normal. Sometimes protesters are killed, beaten, arrested. Sometimes after the protest has ended, they will be arrested from their home. I know several of my colleagues from Russia who have been in this exact scenario. That creates a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty even after events have ended. And, and that's uh, why the Russian government is so effective at, at killing revolutions, essentially. Professors, students, and anyone associated with Western or liberal-leaning educational institutions within Russia have largely fled. So most of my former professors, most of my colleagues have left Russia, either forcefully or initially because they knew what was going to happen. Those that remain are under surveillance. Russian government control is secure, but I also want to note here that it is becoming less secure by the year, and that's because the number of people who only have access to Russian state media is going down year over year. Part of this is just because the younger populations tend to use modern technology more. They tend to use VPNs to access news from other countries. Um, and they also are educating their parents and their grandparents and their older siblings. So it's it's not like next year we're going to see a dramatic increase and the year after that an even more dramatic increase. However, I do think that we are seeing a pretty significant generational shift.
So the last thing I want to go over here is how do we help? Um, number one, if you want to donate, RASM for Ukraine is at the forefront of American efforts to provide humanitarian aid to Ukrainians on the ground. They're a long-established and well-trusted organization with partners in Ukraine. I've worked with them personally for several years. They are wonderful people, and they're very transparent. So if you were to look them up, you can see just about every single thing that they've ever assisted with, the, the funding that they've raised, and, and so on. I, th I think they're a pretty trustworthy source. Number two is to remember to treat Russians and Ukrainians kindly. The Ukrainian diaspora in the United States is suffering massive trauma. Reach out to your community to ask if you can help. You can start with um, local Ukrainian Orthodox churches. That's usually a good place to start. But don't ostracize or harm Russians, many of whom are also very scared right now. This also gives Russia a foothold to insist that they must protect their own against aggression and creates kind of a nonstop cycle. And the third thing is I would ask that everybody here and, and everybody watching this in the future, be prepared to calmly talk about what's happening. Spread what you know, talk about it with your friends and your family and your students. Use trusted news sources. Don't allow your personal fear about what this might mean for the future and about you know World War III and nuclear warfare to dictate your morals or your opinions. Make sure that you're keeping those in, in very separate baskets. And now I will open it up for q and I apologize. I think I rushed through that a lot faster than I expected. So hopefully we'll be able to get to any questions that you may have. Uh, feel free to type them in the chat. I'll use the remaining time to answer them. If there's any that I don't get a chance to answer or any that you think of later, you can also feel free to email me at rebecca.mcgory at gmail.com. And again, if anybody is unable to type for whatever reason, um, I would also invite you to go ahead and turn your mic on and, and I'll answer questions that way. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen for now. If anybody wants me to go back to a specific slide because it pertains to their question, I'm happy to do that as well. We do already have one question in the chat, um, which is, as someone who has lived, worked, and studied in the region, can you share some of the sentiments from Ukrainians and their response to things like international aid, social media campaigns, and other non-Ukrainian influences, both supportive and not supportive? <laughs> Sorry, muted myself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think... Um... I'll break this down into a, a few parts because I feel like there's a few different parts to this question. One of the ones that I want to note first and foremost is that Ukrainians, and I, I think that for the most part they're right on this, don't view this as a Ukrainian war that they are receiving assistance from the outside world in. Most Ukrainians view this as Ukraine being the, the battlefront for all of Europe and the West as a whole. And again, I say this thinking that for the most part, they're pretty correct about that. And I say that because A, they were utilized intentionally by NATO, by the EU, by the United States government in general, um, specifically for this purpose. And also because there's a pretty acute understanding there. And I think even a pretty acute understanding in neighboring countries to Ukraine, like Poland, for example, and Romania, that Russia, although may not be intentionally attempting to win this war anymore, they are very much intentionally mm, threatening, threatening the rest of the world or responding to a threat that they perceive that they've received from the rest of the world. The result is that Ukraine is kind of being used um, as the weapon, as the spear that Europe is pointing at Russia. And so they feel entitled to a lot of this aid. And I don't mean that in the sense of entitlement that they aren't grateful or that they aren't, um, you know, giving credit where credit is due. It's not like that. I think it's more along the lines of they see this as a united Western uh, front, a united Western attempt, and that they're the ones that are being trusted at, at the forefront of it. When it comes to social media campaigns, I think one of the things that Ukrainians are looking for is if these are Ukrainian started social media campaigns or if these are social media campaigns that were started in the West 
that are just kind of being touted as something that's useful to Ukrainians. Um, so, for example, what I've seen from a lot of my Ukrainian friends and a lot of my Ukrainian colleagues is that they want to share news that's coming from inside of Ukraine. And they're really, really grateful when people in the West share the news that's coming from inside of Ukraine. But they don't react really or or have very much to say about any type of meme or, or post that's being made by somebody in the West about Ukraine. Um, I think that this goes for, for just about any conflict to be honest, that people want their own voices to be the ones that that are heard. When it comes to not supportive um, matters, I think that in general, there's some denial. I think that some Ukrainians genuinely just don't even want to believe that this could be possible, that there's anybody in the world that genuinely believes that the Ukrainian government is a, a Nazi government and that that's why the war is happening. So I do see a fair share of denial. And among those that that don't deny it, those that kind of acknowledge and accept that this is happening, it's honestly a lot of sadness. Uh, there's there's anger, as I mentioned earlier, and there's grief. But when it comes to this specifically, it's almost like they're they're so shocked that they can't even react strongly. It just tends to be a lot of really um, kind of de- depressed, I would say, reactions and um, a little bit of a loss of hope, which is really disheartening to see. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Marissa. If it didn't, or if you have a, a follow-up question, feel free to type that in there. Um, next question. There's a lot of information circling social media. How do you recommend us going about finding correct or accurate information and engaging some of the potentially harmful misinformation, which is a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. So I would say as far as finding correct and accurate information, my number one recommendation would be to make sure that you have some access to some news that's coming from inside of Ukraine. Um, and it's it's quite easy to do. You can find the key of times, for example, and, and you can translate it into English. I do want to do a quick disclaimer here that unfortunately... Google Translate for Ukrainian is absolutely abysmal. It's quite good with Russian, but it is terrible with Ukrainian. So Ukrainian articles that people try to translate into English don't tend to be super readable. But you can often find English versions of them. Um, And not even only Ukrainian. There are other um, countries that kind of hold stake in this that have been doing some really interesting reporting as well. For example, the Caucasus. Georgian News has a lot of really... In intriguing and in insightful um, perspectives about this. So I would say that's that's number one for finding correct or accurate information. If you see what looks to be a really outlandish claim, if you're reading something that um, in either direction seems like, wow, I can't believe this isn't a headline, I would recommend that you double check it. Um, there are, of course, some websites like Snopes that are specifically dedicated to Um, determining the the truth or not truth in a lot of this. But even when it hasn't been addressed by one of those big names, it's often not very difficult to find um, the original the original claim. So if someone says there's a document that came out that says X, Y, Z, it's usually not hard to go and find a translated version of that document and determine what you think it means. Engaging some of the potentially harmful misinformation is a a really important question. I think number one is to make sure that if there are any Ukrainians in that conversation that are already engaging the the potentially harmful misinformation, that you're following their lead. And that can be really difficult because sometimes they are responding really emotionally and not necessarily um, the way that you yourself might have responded. So sometimes it can be tempting to post a comment under that and say, you know, X, Y, Z was really emotional, but here's what I found. I don't recommend that because I I think that it's not helpful to Ukraine to to feel as though their feelings about something is are being dismissed. However, what you can do is link to articles that um, you at the very least view as being reliable, something that you view as being reasonably neutral, that a person who is sharing something really, really dramatic may also be able to perceive as a, a useful alternative to the information that they're seeing. Um, I... <laughs> I'm certainly not one to ever stray away from an argument online, and I will admit that. However, I think it's important 
to make sure that we're also examining our motivations for doing so. Um, if the if the argument that you're having or the information that you're presenting is useful to Ukraine, and if this person who you are discussing something with or who's providing this misinformation seems like they are genuinely threatening, then I always, always would say do it. However, if you are seeing somebody who is purely behaving in a manner that that a troll would behave in, if it seems like they are only trying to elicit an emotional response from you, I wouldn't engage that at all. Let's see. Um, uh, we, we have another question that it's concerning to see recent cooling of support from Poland and now Slovakia, uh, given agricultural issues, etc. Is Russia successfully creating a wedge between Ukraine and its supportive neighbors? I do. I do think to some degree. Um, I think it would be giving a little bit too much credit to Russia to say that they perfectly orchestrated this. I think it's more along the lines of they were relying on playing the long game because this is what happens in the long game, period. I can't think of a conflict in history between two countries that has not eventually seen the tapering off of support from other countries. Um, and so I, I think that this was bound to happen. With that being said, I do think that Poland and Slovakia have GDPs that cannot necessarily keep up with supporting an entire war in a neighboring country. I think that Russia's actions and behaviors and, and very clear indications that they are intending on making this long and drawn out are a way of manipulating that. So by by proving essentially to the world that this is not going to end anytime soon, by by potentially leaking papers that show a 10-year genocide plan in Mariupol, they're proving to everybody that this is a long haul and that anybody who is supporting Ukraine is going to have to be prepared to be participating for that long. And that's why I think that we are seeing a lot of that, as you mentioned, really concerning cooling of support. And it's not just Poland and Slovakia either. I think even the United States, the fact that, you know, the, the resolution was recently passed to prevent the government shutdown didn't include any Ukrainian aid. These are things that Ukrainians are certainly paying very close attention to. I don't know that we could say that Russia has created a political wedge, but they are definitely creating a a space, a, a distance in between Ukraine and its allies. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Steve. If you have any follow up questions, let me know. Oh, great. And then you mentioned original motivations from Russia being focused on keeping Ukraine out of the EU and NATO. Uh, what do you think about Ukraine's future with either or both of those entities? And as a follow-up, can you speak to what has changed in Russia's motivations, if anything? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I want to start with the NATO part of that question, because I honestly don't think that NATO has much of a future period. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But the number one reason is that NATO was created specifically to avoid Russian aggression in Europe. NATO functionally could never exist with that goal in mind so long as Ukraine wasn't a member of it. And the fact that Ukraine was never a member of NATO says to me that it was always just kind of the, the stick. This was the stick that the West was wielding against Russia and never necessarily intended to, to be a weapon itself. And that was why as relations and as the, the con original conflict that started in 2014 cooled, NATO started indicating that they were more willing to let Ukraine join because it, it was becoming clearer or they thought that it was becoming clearer that Ukraine would join and, and just be a part of the stick and would never actually need to be utilized. So do I think that Ukraine will ever join NATO? It's possible. I also think that we're going to see a disbanding of NATO. And even if we don't, NATO doesn't exist in any type of functional capacity right now. There is nothing that NATO does um, or represents that is holding up its original purpose. The EU is a much more interesting question. I do think that Ukraine will be allowed into the EU. I genuinely think that. Now, whether or not that happens in the next 10 years is a little more difficult because we are kind of sliding backward into that exact same impasse that we saw in 2015 to 2016. And while Putin is still president, he's viewed as kind of a wild card, which is exactly what he wants. That's the exact image that he has catered for himself. And it's correct. Um, and the, the result is that there 
are certain countries in the EU, especially more conservative countries, that are very, very anxious about the idea of letting a country it is in active conflict into the EU. This is especially true because the reason that EU and NATO both have these parameters set up that a country that's in active conflict can't join is because, in theory, a country that's in the EU that is at active conflict is at war with all of the others as well. So allowing Ukraine into the EU while they're at war with Russia would essentially be saying that the EU is obligated to join, formally join in on this war as well. Um, the motivations for this are actually quite similar to Brexit, if anyone here is familiar with what happened with Brexit. So that's not to say that the EU is always going to stand by and enforce all of its rules. There have been many in the last several years that have not done so. But I, I do think that we will see Ukraine join the EU. The follow-up question, what has changed in Russia's motivations, if anything? Uh, I definitely think that the motivations have changed, but in saying so, I actually think that they've kind of regressed. So in February of 2022, I absolutely do believe that Russia invaded Ukraine with every intention of taking over the country and, and re-annexing it. There's a lot of evidence to support this. One of them is that going back to the beginning of Putin's political career, he has always idolized the Soviet Union and publicly commented on how the loss of the Soviet Union was the greatest loss of the century. He would love to rebuild the Soviet Union, and Ukraine is a really integral part of that. Um, the second is that I, I don't know if anyone here remembers the headlines or even saw the headlines. However, um, I think it was about a month or so into this phase of the war following the invasion that um, Western news started picking up on a mistake that Russian the Russian state website had made, which was that they had accidentally left the draft of their official statement following the successful takeover of Ukraine on their website. There were a few different ways that this was reported. Um, it's been reported that they accidentally posted it. It's been reported that they um, posted it intentionally and then took it back down. What my understanding is that they didn't actually post it. However, hackers were able to view the original draft in the coding of the website because it hadn't been deleted, even when it was determined that the original invasion of Kiev hadn't been successful. In this document from the Russian government, it referred not only to the annexation of Ukraine, but also to plans to annex Belarus. So it was essentially trying to become a, a tri-state union again. That was their motivation. I think once Ukraine started showing kind of the fight that it's showing now, once international aid started pouring in, I think the motivations cooled a little bit. And I think that now we're back at a point where they want to keep the fight active enough to A, prevent any type of military retaliation and re-annexing Crimea, B, to avoid losing the fronts that they've gained in Luhansk and Donetsk, because it's also worth noting here, there are Ukrainians in Luhansk and Donetsk that support this. It's it's not completely one-sided. There are Ukrainians that, that believe in the Russian mission. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I just kind of lost my train of thought here. But I, I think that the final piece of it is that Russia now recognizes that the degree of inactive conflict that was happening at the time from 2016 to the end of 2021 isn't enough because the EU and NATO started talking about annexing Ukraine or sorry, about allowing Ukraine to join anyway. So now I think they're seeing it as we need to keep the conflict up here rather than down here. We need to keep it up here. If it's up here, maybe the EU won't let them in. Maybe NATO won't let them in. And a lot of it really does kind of come down to a security dilemma. I don't know that Russia thinks that even if Ukraine was allowed into the EU, that Poland would actually attack them. I, I genuinely don't think that Putin believes that. And I don't even believe that necessarily. But I think that what it what it really comes down to is if this is an escalating security dilemma and if it's going to continue escalating over the next 10 years or so, it's in their best interest to make sure that it's escalating in a way that does not give Ukraine or the West any type of leg up, so to speak. We definitely have time for more questions if anybody has anything else that they want to ask. Um, while we wait to see if anybody else types anything, I would like to just thank you, Rebecca, for your donating your time and your expertise. This has been uh, a fascinating program and we've had some really great questions from the audience. So thank you as well to our patrons.
yeah, thank you so much for having me. And again, I apologize for rushing through it. <laughs> I can't believe it took me as little time <laughs> as it did, but I've really enjoyed the questions. There have been some really great questions so far. I am going to repost our feedback link. Um, oh, and we have another question. Uh, oh, no, that's just Christy talking about her upcoming programs. <laughs> Okay, uh, one more question. How has the conflict in Ukraine affected the prospects for democratic development and human rights in the region? I think that virtually all democratic development and human rights development stops once a country enters into any type of active conflict or active war. And I think that Ukraine's not an exception to that. I think we're we're seeing human rights go in the opposite direction. And I think that the fact that Ukraine has martial law at all could probably be used as pretty significant evidence that they are certainly not seeing more democratic development. I don't necessarily think that they're seeing anti-democratic anti development. I, I don't interpret the announcement of martial law, for example, as an attempt to further militarize Ukraine. I see it more as establishing resources, because in a wartime, young men of fighting age are seen as resources. However, I, I do think that if Ukraine is lucky, this is putting a pause on both democratic development and human rights. If Ukraine is not lucky, then I think that we're very likely to see a setback. This is particularly true in the case of human rights, largely because of the atrocity that Ukrainians are being exposed to right now. Human rights in countries that have been in times of peace for a long time tend to become more and more specific and more and more refined. So human rights in the United States, for example, which hasn't had an active war on our territory in just about any any time that, that we can identify since the Civil War. <clears throat> so sorry. Human rights here has started focusing on very particular rights for um, disabled individuals, for example, gender rights. In countries that are at war, human rights look a lot more general and a lot um in some cases uh, a lot more reduced so human rights in ukraine right now looks like the right to live in your city and not have it be taken over by russia it looks like the right to not be tortured if you don't want to be exported to russia human rights looks like not being murdered or sexually assaulted in one of the cities that have been completely flattened in Ukraine, one of the ghost cities that that now no longer have any living people in them. Um, and because of that, I don't I don't know a how they could work on furthering human rights otherwise. And B, I think that they're very likely to be recovering from the trauma of that for a long time and unable to focus on other human rights matters while they do. The collective trauma, the collective generational trauma that this is producing and has produced is probably going to create a population of people who are very, very focused on the big picture, but the big picture is not always super conducive to human rights. Uh, and then Marissa follows up with additionally in regards to development, what is your opinion on the future of Ukraine? I think that Ukraine cannot remain a, a catalyst between Europe and Russia forever. I think that they're going to have to develop in one direction or the other, and that given the ferocity with which they were able to fight back what was anticipated initially kind of across the board to be a, a one-and-done assault, an annexation um, in this century, that probably we're going to see that development moving more towards Europe. Um, there will probably be setbacks, but I think that generally speaking, we can expect to see increased trade between Ukraine and Europe. We can expect to see uh, additional border openings and roads and train lines. I mean, there's, there's not a shortage of trains right now that go from Ukraine into Poland, but I bet we'll see significantly more access to countries like Romania and Hungary. Um, I think that this is going to probably be very slow moving, and to some degree, it may even be a military tactic on the part of the EU, A, to keep Ukraine's requests to join the EU at bay, 
and B, to prevent Russia from expanding further west. Because if, for example, there is now a, a brand new train line that is going from Hungary all the way to Kiev, every time Russia were to launch a missile in, the, in that direction would be at risk of destroying a new European rail line. Um, so I, I suspect it will be used somewhat as a tactic, but I also think that development is development and that's the direction that we'll go in. Um, you address this in part, at least, um, on how to, you know, make sure that you're sharing correct news sources and not speaking over Ukrainians and things like that. But how else can we best support Ukrainians from the U.S.? I don't know if there are particular aid organizations you think um, yeah. are good to look into. So one of the things that I recommend is starting with local Ukrainian Orthodox churches. And I say that only because the most vulnerable population within the United States right now, as it pertains to Ukrainians, are Ukrainians that have temporary protected status. So in the resettlement world, I'll, I'll go into kind of the resettlement side of things here now. There are lots of different statuses that anybody can have. One of them is um, refugee status, or in this case, they've been delegated a separate status called Ukrainian humanitarian parolee. But for the most part, any refugee, Ukrainian refugee that's being resettled in the U.S. has Ukrainian humanitarian parolee, UH, UHP status. Ukrainians that were already in the United States on February 24th of 2022 were given what's called TPS, Temporary Protected Status, and that means that they cannot be kicked out of the United States. However, they are not privy to the same privileges and funding that people who came in outside of it are privy to. What that means is that if you have a student who is doing a one semester study abroad in Ukraine, um, maybe who's in the exact same position as an 18 year old who arrived on February 25th, right? We could see somebody who lost all of their, their family in Sumy Oblast during the fighting or in, in Kharkiv. Um, and they happen to be here already. They've received TPS status, but they have no finances. They have no resources. They have only the Ukrainian community around them, which is very focused right now on providing aid and resources back to Ukraine and understandably so. So if you're looking to help Ukrainians, I would say that's the most vulnerable population that you should look at right now. Um, of course, in general, assisting Ukrainians in the United States, any resettlement organization, um, you know, will, will be able to provide support to Ukrainian humanitarian parolees. We've seen um, a really sad number of unaccompanied children. So these are children that arrive without their guardians. There are a lot of Ukrainian unaccompanied children in this country right now. If you reach out to a local resettlement agency, which is very easy to do, by the way, you can just Google Ukrainian, or sorry, you can just Google resettlement agency near me and call them and ask how to to assist with specifically Ukrainian populations. Um, but they're they're looking for volunteers if you have time. They're looking for donations if you have funds to spare. Um, and I think that they're looking for support in general. I, I think that even if what your support looks like is just publishing a paragraph supporting them in your local newspaper on a Sunday, that that's still meaningful. Because as someone mentioned earlier, I think it was Steve, there is a lot of cooling support. And they're very sensitive to that. They're very aware of that. And, and making sure that Ukrainians know that there are people who have not forgotten them, who will not, forgot, who will not forget them, and who are not willing to kind of give give up their support for that as it becomes the less sexy news option um, is really important. Great. I think that might wrap up our questions. Um, again, this was fascinating and thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for coming to the presentation. Christy, I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, we have our feedback form link, which again, you can win a library tote bag <laughs> uh, and upcoming programs that might be of interest. We have a weekly world affairs group um, that meets on Zoom on Mondays. And on October 19th, we have a Cohen Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies 2023 Memorial Lecture featuring author Dana Horn, or Dara Horn, who will be doing a Q and A as well as a presentation. Thank you, Robin, for wrapping things up. I'm all, all set. I appreciate you mentioning those programs. And thank you, Rebecca. This was wonderful. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening.